Hi. Today our focus is rotational kinetic energy. So we have three goals today. First, we'll simply define what rotational kinetic energy is. Then, we're going to apply the concept of rotational kinetic energy to a very common situation, which is a spinning figure skater. And the third thing is, this is actually our last video that deals with rotation. And so we're going to take a few minutes and just look at all the parallels that we have between rotational motion and straight line motion. Okay, so rotational kinetic energy, what is it? Well, if you think about what kinetic energy is, it's energy associated with motion. And so rotational kinetic energy is energy associated with rotational motion. And we're going to write down an equation for it, which is just analogous to that, our one-half mv squared equation that we use for straight line motion. Okay, so here we have our familiar equation for kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, and that applies to something that's moving, kind of in linear motion, straight line motion. We also apply it to things that are uh, moving in parabolas and things like that. Okay, so you can replace the uh, mass in this equation by the rotational inertia. You can place the v by omega, the angular speed, and you can get the equivalent equation for rotational kinetic energy. K is one-half i, that's the rotational uh, inertia, multiplied by omega squared, that's the square of the angular speed. And so if an object is only moving in straight line motion, all it's got is one-half mv squared, worth of kinetic energy. If it's rotating only, it's only got rotational kinetic energy. Some objects, such as rolling objects, those are good examples, are both translating. Translating means moving in a straight line. And rotating at the same time. Okay, so a wheel that's rolling along the, uh, the ground is a good example of this. So then you say, well, the kinetic energy for this rolling object has two pieces to it. It's got the translational kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, plus the rotational kinetic energy, one-half i omega squared. Okay, so you can have only the, ro the uh, straight line motion kind, only the rotational kind, and some objects you have both. Okay, so here's an example of a figure skater. And we looked at the figure skater a little bit when we talked about angular momentum conservation. So a figure skater, when she pulls her arms in close, then her uh, angular speed increases because she decreases her rotational inertia. And to conserve angular, angular momentum, you have to have a corresponding increase in the angular velocity. But what happens to the rotational kinetic energy in this process? Okay, so the figure skater moves her arms in closer, so she spins faster. Does the rotational kinetic energy go up, go down, or stay the same because of energy conservation? So think about that for a couple of seconds. And then we'll see what happens. So we're going to just work it out here, to work out the kinetic energy. And here's our initial kinetic energy, and we apply rotational kinetic energy here because the figure skater is only rotating. So the initial kinetic energy is one-half times the initial rotational inertia times the initial angular speed squared. And then we're going to write out omega i squared as omega i times omega i. Okay? And there's a reason we're going to do that, and we'll put the I initial, omega initial in brackets, and we'll talk about why we're doing that in a minute. So we can then do the same thing for the final kinetic energy. Final kinetic energy is one-half times the final rotational inertia. That's different from the initial rotational inertia. Multiplied by the square of the speed, the, uh, the angular speed. And that's different also from what it was originally. And we can write omega f squared as omega f times omega f and we can put i f omega f in brackets, as we did with the i i omega i. Now, why are we doing that? Well, if you look at what's in brackets in these two equations, i initial times omega initial, 
Well, that's the magnitude of the angular momentum. I final omega final is the magnitude of the final angular momentum. So we have the initial angular momentum and the final angular momentum. And because of conservation of angular momentum, those things have to be equal. So when you're comparing the kinetic energies, we've got the factors of a half in each equation. Well, those are the same. The factors that are in brackets, I initial omega initial, and IF omega F are equal to one another because of angular momentum conservation. And so what's different then is just omega I and omega F. And in this case, the figure skater brings her arms in close and so speeds up, so omega F is larger than omega I. So in this case, her final kinetic energy is bigger than the initial kinetic energy. Okay? So then you have to ask yourself, you know, where does this extra kinetic energy come from? Because, you know, energy just can't show up from nowhere. Okay, so something has to put this energy into the system. So where does that come from? So if you think about it, the only place it can come from is the figure skater herself. And so what happens is it actually takes some effort, some force, for that skater to bring her arms in. So when she's spinning, her arms want to really be far out from the, her body. So her, she has to do work, positive work, exerting an inward directed force on her arms. So the displacement is inward, the force she exerts on her arms is inward. And the work that she does actually shows up in the system as an increase in rotational kinetic energy. So that's kind of interesting. So in this figure skater example, angular momentum is conserved, but rotational kinetic energy is not. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our introduction to rotational kinetic energy. And now we're just going to go back and kind of summarize sort of everything we know about straight line motion and its rotational counterpart. Okay, so we'll do two screens worth of this stuff. So we get a bunch of variables that we found to be useful for straight line motion, such as position, velocity, acceleration, and all of those variables have rotational equi equivalents. Theta, to measure angular position. Omega, angular velocity. Alpha, angular acceleration. And you see, you can connect the straight line motion variables to the rotational variables just with a factor of r. Okay, so divide the straight line motion variable by r, and you have the rotational variable there. Okay, so the, we've got position, velocity, acceleration, and then we have what produces acceleration. Well, to produce an acceleration, you have to have a net force. If you're talking about acceleration a, if you want angular acceleration alpha, well, you need a net torque. And, of course, there's a connection between force and torque as well. Torque is... The magnitude of the torque, at least, is the magnitude of the distance, the forces from the axis of rotation, multiplied by the magnitude of the force, multiplied by the sine of the angle between the line you're measuring distance along and the line of the force. Then we have inertia. Inertia is kind of an object's tendency to uh, not to accelerate, in a sense. Okay, so the best measure of that for straight line motion is simply the mass. For rotational motion, we need the rotational inertia, which involves the mass, how the mass is distributed, and what axis you're rotating around. And rotational inertia, remember, is some constant c times mr squared. And the c depends on what the shape is and what axis the object is being rotated around. Then we have momentum. Momentum, we've got a nice straight line motion uh, variable we call p and an equivalent thing for rotational motion, angular momentum, and that is denoted by L. And there's a connection between the angular momentum and the linear momentum, which is very similar to the connection between torque and force. L is RP sine theta. Okay, so then we'll look at a few more things. We've got Newton's second law. So for straight line motion, that's the sum of all the forces added up as vectors is the mass times the acceleration. For rotational motion, we have an equivalent equation. Sum of all the torques added up as vectors is the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. 
we have an impulse equation. So if you want to change something's linear momentum, you have to apply a force for a particular time interval, and the change in momentum is equal to the force multiplied by that time interval. Similar equation for rotation, replace force by torque, replace linear momentum by angular momentum. A torque acting for a time interval produces a change in angular momentum. Kinetic energy, we've just seen that. The translational kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. Rotational kinetic energy, one-half i omega squared. There's a work equation we've seen. So if you want the net work, then you've got to multiply the net force. And this probably shouldn't have a vector symbol on top. It's just the magnitude of the net force multiplied by the magnitude of the displacement multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the net force and the displacement. That's the change in kinetic energy, but that's also the work. Same thing with torque. The uh, net work done in a rotational sense is just the magnitude of the net torque multiplied by the magnitude of the angular displacement multiplied by the cosine of the angle between those vectors. Okay, so in both cases, the you should not really have a vector symbol on top there. Then there's a power equation. Once again, we don't need the vector sign here. Uh, the net force multiplied by the velocity multiplied really by the speed, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the net force and the speed, and the velocity actually, it's a vector. But it's the magnitude of the net force multiplied by the magnitude of the velocity, which is the speed, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the vectors. And that's the power. Similar equation for rotation. Magnitude of the torque multiplied by magnitude of the angular velocity multiplied by the cosine of the angle between those vectors gets you the power, the rate at which energy is being done. And you can always get from a straight line motion equa equation to its rotational equivalent by making the appropriate substitutions. Force goes to torque, mass goes to rotational inertia, displacement goes to angular displacement, V goes to omega, A goes to alpha, etc., etc. Momentum goes to ang uh, angular momentum. Okay. So anything we've done for straight line motion has a rotational equivalent. Okay, so that is it for today.